where I'm supposed to look. Hi, my name is Deb Bottomley, and I am an artist that lives in Milford. And we are going to explore a little bit of watercolor, things that you can do. And all of our paintings or our inspiration are going to be coming from areas in um, Upton. And we'd like to take thank uh, the Upton Cultural Center for giving us this opportunity. And I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to play. So let's get started. Um, today I am going to be working in watercolor. As I said, we're going to work on um, scenes that might be familiar to you. Um, I was thinking that if you are at home and you're like, oh, I've got some watercolors in some drawer or something that you've never really used or you haven't pulled them out for a long time, we're hoping that maybe we get you a little inspiration and get you going. Um, I have a few other areas that might look um, familiar to you down here at the center with the, um, the statue to the Loyal Sons from the Civil War mon Monument. And of course, you probably recognize the United Parish of Upton. We might get to working on that a little later. Um, also, across the road from the center, I'm not sure what this building is. It didn't seem to be marked as a church, but it is apparently an older church. Um, and I just found, I love um, all the architecture, the older buildings, and all the uh, woodwork and everything. So I, this is kind of your unusual, um, uh, come here, you stance. You might recognize the building. Excuse me. Come on, baby. Open up. There we go. You might recognize that building uh, right here, and then you've got that little commerce center with the t-shirts and things right to the... So, if you are inspired and you begin to walk around your town with your camera, um, there's a lot of things you can do when you get home with your photos. Um, and you'll see that sometimes I'm working from a photo and it's... Um, more as inspiration. I'm not actually trying to create exactly everything I see there. I might just use it for the shapes. Um, sometimes I have pictures that I, it's just because I'm taking it for the cloud. Um, I wanted to show you a few things. The, um, this picture is in oil and um, this was also inspired by a photo that I took we walk in the Upton Forest often. And so this is um, one of the shots during the fall. Uh, we tend to go there quite often for um, cross-country skiing when the weather's uh, suitable. And we've got another, this is a, in pastel. And this is basically the same area. If you, any of you are familiar with um, when you go to the the forest and the parking lot. This building, and then there's this um, main building too. Um, I guess, you know, they're the, the state buildings for the worker bees and whatever. Um, and so some of the pictures uh, in the, the forest, that's where these came from. So that might look familiar to you. And we'll get to this. This is a, in a pastel. And as you can see, it's a totally different approach to um, laying the strokes in and um, this one was something I was playing with the other day is doing it in watercolor and that's kind of what we're gonna start with um, same building just different approach um, so I want to show you a few things with that and now most of you some of you might find you have a watercolor set like this. This is just from Christmas Tree Shop. Uh, watercolors come into tubes. If you do have a tube set, um, you want to go and find yourself um, a palette that you can fill the wells of your, your paints. Um, and what you'll see is that 
it, when I start a painting, as you see, I've already got these because I had been working on um, some painting, but if there's some color that I want to add to this, um, I'm just going to, now I haven't really used these, so let me take, I tend to keep a pair of pliers in my kit because when I'm working with these, um, this has got a very nice clean uh, threads here. You're just going to squeeze out a little bit and what I tend to do is I dip it in the water before I seal it. That'll keep it from getting so it seals and you can't get it open because you will find I've got older tubes and I don't know if you can see that but this one's all twisted down so uh, you don't have to throw this out this paint doesn't go bad it even if it's dried and hard you could take a razor blade cut that open just dump your dried pigment into your well and you can reconstitute it and so if you think, oh, these aren't any good, I have to throw them out, um, don't worry about that. Because as you're probably more familiar with the paint sets that come in the pans already, and then you just constitute them. They come in uh, different types of sets. This set is actually, they're all opaque colors. I tend to paint with uh, transparent watercolors which is, it allows you to see the white and read the white of the paper below it. Um, if I were painting with a, an opaque color, it lays on heavier. You can't see through it and it will cover up the other paints. Sometimes if there's a, a painting that you've been working on and you want to keep it all watercolor as uh, Let's say you're getting to the point you're putting things in a show or something. Then a watercolor society would have a stipulation about the percentage of watercolor um, medium as far as being mixed into others. So if um, you're still safe with coming through with an opaque color, sometimes you'll hear them referred to as a, a casein paint, which is a milk paint and you will also hear um, gouache. And gouache is actually kind of coming back into vogue and a lot of uh, oil painters are uh, using the gouache when they want to do a small sketch to kind of get their bearings on where they're going to go with a bigger painting because those react a little bit more um, like the oil paint because it is um, opaque and you will kind of get the same effects. Now, so I just wanted to show you that any of these, all you're doing is dropping water back into them to constitute them. For me, once I get started, I have my little squirt bottle and I usually just come around and give everybody a shot of water and then they'll soften back up. Now, as you might find, depending on who you're talking to, um, people will have different approaches, and I'm just showing you what works for me. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are paints here. I, I use these uh, bays for just mixing. Back to when you think um, a tube of watercolor is probably no good. This is what happens sometimes when you go to twist that cap open and it, this has sealed. Uh, this was an older tube so I didn't, a lot of times I'll just soak it until I can get the cap off. But if it just twists and breaks, that does not stop me, that is this color in here. I tend to throw this into my bay and just fill it with water and that will soften up the paint that's in there. And I'm also very frugal, so I'm using every little inch that I can. Or I'll just take a razor blade and dig in there and then pull that paint out and put it back into the, the tray. So once these um, dry I, and you put them up back on your shelf, the next time you're ready to paint, just pull them out and get your water going and you're, you're all set. 
Another thing that's kind of handier instead of walking around with your, your big sprayer, if you take your old eye drop um, and you can refill it with water and then that's a, another easy way to reconstitute some of these paints. And you do that just by snapping that off, dipping it into your water and refill it. So that makes it if you're going out and you're going to go paint plain air or you're sitting in the back seat of the car and you're trying to paint something tiny, um, that gives you a quick, easy, small um, water source. I tend to use just rags that I have cut up um, or paper towels, but with the rags that I, I um, cut up, I can always throw these into the wash and go on. So now as I start, sometimes um, with papers I use uh, uh, Arches watercolor paper. There's a lot of different manufacturers and you just need to try them all. You'll find different, um, uh, sometimes they'll feel different when you go to paint on them. Uh, so, just paint with whatever you've got. The 140 is kind of a common weight. Uh, it does go up to 300. Uh, for painting with larger watercolors, if I was doing something this big, I would want to mount it to some kind of surface because the more water that you work with, the paper will tend to buckle. Um, what will happen is the paper kind of relaxes and it starts to wave on you but if you have it tacked down either with tape or I'm going to show you uh, what works for me um, then it, it will once it dries out it'll flatten back out and it'll be fine so then when you go to to um, frame it the you won't have these waves in, in the board or in the, the paper so that is something we will show you right now now as you can see on some of these boards, I pre-sketched the, uh, the center just because there's a lot of detail in there. So as you see, this is stapled onto a board. And what I, I use, it's called Homa Soap. And it's a compressed fiber board made of basically recycled paper um, and fibers, or wood fibers. They sell it, um, I use this a lot for a lot of things. It, if I'm working on something, a sewing, I have the four by eight sheet that it comes in that I, I use that as my work surface. And the homosote is, you can pin into it. Um, I also do stained glass and so it is a surface that I can solder on, I can hold my pieces of glass into. If I'm sewing, I can punch the, the pins into the fabric and hold it. So I started using this also for just mounting my watercolor. Um, it, it makes the paper hold for me. I can, it's easier just to have it stacked around and when it's time to remove it, it's quick and easy. So all I'm doing is, and you don't have to run out and buy homo if if you're thinking about doing this. Smaller pieces of paper, you can hold them in your hand. You don't have to mount them to anything. Uh, but otherwise, if you want it on more secure, you can use tape, uh, anything that will hold it to whatever your board is. A lot of people use a gator board or even just foam core and they'll they'll take their surface to that. So if we're, I will show you how I would go about this. Alright. You can stand it right over there. Alright, so now we have a board. Sometimes if you've got a little paint on there you might have to check to make sure that isn't going to bleed somewhere but it should be 
okay and usually you can just kind of wipe it off if it does uh, bleed on you. So if I were starting my paper and I wanted to, <laughs> well, if I wanted to mount it on there, all I'm going to do is take my water bottle, my handy dandy, everybody has one stapler. So I'm going to determine which is my face and which is the uh, back, doesn't really matter. Some papers you will notice might be a little bit smoother on one side, might be a little rougher on the other. The um, 140 watercolor paper, usually it will come in a hot press and that is very smooth. So if you are the type of person that you like working in pen and ink or you like a lot of detail, um, you might want to try some um, hot press because that is the smoothest, here's, here's a piece, it's very, very smooth, uh, there's no texture to it. And so that might be something you'd want to experiment with. The standard is called a cold press. It has a little bit of texture to it. Um, and it's, it is kind of fun because sometimes it, you might pick up some of those little white spots will, will happen because of uh, the, that little bit of texture in the paper. There's also a rough, and that one has bigger divots. And there again, it's, it's just kind of fun to play with uh, what can your brush do? Um, so, we are going to stretch this piece. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little water on the back of it. Now, sometimes I just smear it around with my hands. Uh, or, to make you think I'm really fancy, I am going to use, this is called a mop brush. And when you're doing um, a big watercolor where you just want to have the colors bleeding, um, this is a good way to wet your paper. As you can see, this has uh, kind of the, the brush splays. If you need more control, you might want to start with a flat brush. Um, that will give you a sharper edge and you will see that a lot of people will use something like that as they're brushing the water down and we can show, give you uh, an example of that. Anyway, right now I'm wet. I'm not dripping wet though. I'm just going to lay this down and then I'm going to wet the other side. So it kind of evens itself out. And okay. Depending on what I'm doing with my background, I might I'm just gonna blot a little bit of this so it's not too wet. I might start right away laying in a sky or, or something while the paper is wet. I'm just gonna come in here. I want to keep myself out just within that last uh, quarter inch of the paper. As you can see, it doesn't take much for it to attach to the homosote. And when I'm done with this painting and I want to remove it, it's, let me show you that. So like I said, you don't have to stretch your paper. You just might find um, you like having your paper mounted to something. See how that's starting to ripple a little bit. I don't know if that light's catching that up for you. But this is what happens when the, the paper gets wet on both sides. It relaxes it. And it's, um, when I first started painting um, that with watercolor, at that time we had these big sheets and they told you to put it in the bathtub and soak it for this long and we would um, lay it down on a 
waterproof board and then use that gum, that brown gum tape on all the edges to hold it. Um, that's why over the years and just through listening to other artists, you know, experiment with, like I said, what works for them. Um, sometimes you think, oh, let me try that. And then you might come around with, with something that works for you. So, like I said, now this is wet and I might even want to just wait until it's all dry and uh, stretched. But if I already have an idea of um, what I might want to work on, then I might want to take a look at, at some of those. Yeah, you come up. Let's see if you'll open. Come here. Come on. As you see this photo, the sky is not that bright. The trees are not that bright. When I went and was working with this painting, I wanted to, you know, add a little bit more life than I, I saw in there. So I decided I was going to exaggerate that a little bit. And that is part of your glory as an artist. So I had started with something more along this basis in these back areas. I was kind of mapping out where some of my blue shadows might be going. Also with the watercolor, um, use, standardly you use the white of the paper and you leave the white of the paper. So if that's your lightest area, you don't you don't want to be adding a lot of pigment to those areas because instead of where, what, using white paint, you're using the white paper. Um, so it's something to think of like in, in these areas where you want to maybe try to keep those areas still clean. Um, you know, that little edge of the building. As you see, I, I turned my blue sky, I decided I was going to make it um, more of a, a sunset. And um, uh, those are, actually I'm going to show you a few other things with the watercolor as far as removing some of the, the color. If you find that you're, you're like, oh man, I, I should have saved that part, or, or you're not thrilled because of uh, something looks too harsh. There are things that you can do to manipulate that. Um, and we will work on that a little later. So, all right, this is still wet. And I am going to show you a few things. Because the other thing is when you're starting out painting, and you go to the paint store and you see all these different brushes and you're like, what is, you know, what am I supposed to do with all this? Um, you can, the one thing that you do want to have is a, a round, is what this is called. This is called a flat. The round paint brush, this is a number eight. Um, this is what you will see a lot of watercolors work with. And they will come in all different sizes. This is a, also a round. This is actually a, um, a brush, a Chinese lettering brush. I love these things. They're cheap. <laughs> but what I love is they have so much character in the brush stroke. And that's something that you really want to play with. Because uh, this is, is called a dagger. And you will see that you can just get such different techniques and the things that you can do with these brushes. You want to kind of play with that. Now see, as I do have white, wet paper, do you see how all of this is going to bleed out? Because the water is your solvent when you're working with watercolor. So depending on how much water I have on there, if I have Oh, a whole big, in fact, here we can turn this into some kind of little 
sunset or something. If I add a lot of water in here and I want to come in and I can even use this. Now this paint to you might look a lot darker than these two. It might look closer to this yellow ochre. This is actually a transparent um, yellow and it is for the most part, I use a lot of um, Winsor Newton. I'm also experimenting or checking out. I, whoever's got the sale, I'll look at some of their um, uh, different paints. Uh, and I'm finding some interesting colors from uh, Turner. Okay, so if you wanted to come in here and... This is where I'm saying I, I'm always using a rag, or a rag. I, you will see as I dip my brush into the water, you'll notice that I'm always touching myself with the, or touching back into the rag. I don't want to just cut, or at least for me, it might work for you, but I don't go from here to here to here or from here here. I, I dab it because I don't want it that wet. That's all um, something that you will uh, become more used to the more you work. Um, all right, let's say we want to come in here and, and have some kind of beauteous. And I, a lot of artists you will see will also, um, they'll have two containers of water, one to rinse in and one to re-wet so that way the the re-wet bucket is always clean um, one way to do that is I have the the smaller bucket inside of the bigger bucket I don't always do it this way but at home when I'm looking for space it's easier to have the middle just for rinsing and I can come back out here and get just fresh water um, so that works so there again, as you see, it's fun because it, it just starts bleeding all over the place and uh, you can blend all of these colors together, go in, up into each other. And I, when I was in seventh grade, our art teacher was actually uh, quite... Uh, a talented professional artist as well as a very talented teacher. He believed you never used a, a color straight out of the tube. You always had to mix. And that works for some people. And for some people they end up with um, uh, muddy mixes. So <laughs> you will, you know, there again I'm, I'm uh, saying or uh, it's each person will have a different approach you just kind of experiment see what works for you and there is no absolute right there's no absolute wrong you just play with it and the more you paint the more you'll improve um, Lisa our amazingly talented president of the Blackstone Valley Art Association, which you might want to take a look at and uh, look at the website. She's got tons of things, always busy. But she has been doing uh, watercolors almost every day, and they are so much fun. They are whimsical. They, I'm waiting for her her storybook to come out to go with all these pictures. They are amazing and you you could just see the fun that she's having but she just everything that's going on um I, I see improvements with with all your your painting and you know some people are not so happy with the the staying at home and things and I to me it's such a blessing because it, it's given me more time to focus on certain things and in, in the um, that was always my wish for time. And another thing, if you do check out the Blackstone Valley um, Art Association, once we can go back into face-to-face, -face, um, 
a lot of times on Saturdays they had open paint and you will find a very welcoming group you don't even have to know anything they have supplies for you you can come and sit and paint and play there will be people there that will give you ideas or, or instruction it's very very nice and a lot of times I wish I could have sat and joined but when I was working and once it came to the weekend it was like I don't have time to just be there I have to do this and that and um, <laughs> so that's that's one thing that it's it's kind of nice uh, that this COVID has is, is made us slow down a little bit now sometimes some people will go oh my gosh it's running all over the place to me it's kind of fun because you can go oh hey look at this I could turn this around and all of a sudden I'm gonna have a lake with a, a tree behind it but I'll keep it with my sky anyway you will see this is definitely wet on wet I don't tend to paint with a lot of wet on wet unless I'm laying in a background um, another thing that I want you to do is when you are at home and you have those paint brushes out near or you're at the store and you think hey what is this um, and they are just interesting looking brushes to you another good thing to do is to um, play with them see how many strokes can you get out of some of these I've got a bunch of brushes, they're called fan brushes, and I don't know why I keep moving those. These are um, more of a bristle. You'll notice that the hairs on brushes are different. Sable, br bristle. Um, these are the ones I'm using for watercolor. Some are specific only to oil or um, acrylic. Uh, some, the bristle is, especially hog, that will absorb water. So all of a sudden, if you're trying to use it with a water-soluble paint as uh, acrylic, um, you might start to notice that the brush is acting funny on you and, and it's just, it's getting saturated. So, one of the things that we can do is... With this, you see how that's fanned out. And you see, I was using it when I was making my trees. So if I come in here and I can start just kind of playing with it. Um, another nice thing about watercolor is it, you can build layers. You don't have to do everything in the first um, stroke. So depending on, you know, this, you could use this if you were making grasses somewhere. Or you can use it in more of a, a line of, of trying to, you know, you don't need to paint every leaf on the tree. You're, you're just kind of giving the impression of, of that day or, or that feeling. So is we let this go and I could maybe come in here with a different green while it's still wet let the colors play around with each other you can um, spin them and then that way you've got the paint blending on the paper and kind of working for you that way rather than um, just here's my stroke and that's it there's so many options of what you can do because as I I will show you later you can go back into something and there's different ways you can work it to soften an edge if it just is screaming out at you um, here's another little brush that you'll find at any craft store um, this I don't know if you can see that very well it has little fine hairs on the end and um, I'm forgetting the name of these right now, but a lot of people, if they are doing uh, maybe their picture of their dog or or maybe they're putting um, 
grasses in a field. This kind of brush really works very nicely for doing that. See now I just I just sat there and told you how I always hit it with my <laughs> rag and, and this time I'm not because <laughs> because I can. Um, so as you can see we can get some really nice little fine hair. So if you were working on something that you wanted to uh, indicate grasses on the, the beach or it's your, you know, your cat or, or whatever, you can just get these little brushes and they work quite nicely for that. So same thing with even just a flat. Now, one of the paintings in uh, Upton of that mystery building that I was telling you about, if I'm working on something and I want a lot of like straight lines and, and want to keep things even, I might want to go to what is called a, a flat. And this is a, a half inch. So if I had an area in here that uh, see, I need to thin some of these out. When I'm doing something like this, it has very little color to it. I'm also going to keep my um, paints very thin. The more water I add, the lighter the color is going to be. And then uh, another thing that a lot of people don't like about watercolor is that when they go to lay the color down, when it dries, it, it lightens up. And so that's frustrating to some people. I, on the other hand, kind of like it because I tend to build my um, colors up as I go. So as you can see, like a, there's not a lot of color in these. And, and actually, when I printed this out, I was I turned it to a black and white basically, and and pulled even more color out. So when I'm painting, I'm looking to say, okay, well this band is much lighter than this band, um, and so I don't want to be painting on that. But I'm going to come in here, and then just because of the type of brush I'm using, I can basically darken this area. And I will continue to just let these areas, I, they dry, I come back in, I build them up a little bit further. Um, and then eventually I will have something that's more representational of that. Uh, as you see, I began to block in certain areas. Um, other areas I was leaving um, for today so we could work on this a little bit. Another thing with these flat brushes is sometimes if you're trying to make the straight line, a roof line like that, we're going to take that and you might think that the only way you can use this brush is like this, but you can come in here. I'm just reconstituting this color and and so you'll you'll see me kind of just dig out the corners there. I'm just trying to wet everything. So anyway, with this brush, I can still use it to create a line. Um, I can come in and I can move up. If any of you do lettering, um, you might be familiar with a, a C pen and um, or the nib for a C. This would be like using a, a C that um, you can come in here and do lots of things with these brushes. And the other thing is I'm pretty mean to my brushes too. So I don't hold them as, oh my gosh, I this was a $30 brush. I, you know, I don't want to ruin it. Um, at this point, it's like I haven't really ruined many $30 brushes. <laughs> I, 
it's what's fun and what you will find more painterly is if you start playing with your brushes and just say, well, okay, what can I get out of this thing? And a lot of times you'll see artists working like off of the side of the brush rather than straight up and down. Um, and you will see some artists that are working on something very tiny, but they're using a huge brush. And you think, oh, you're kidding. And that all just comes from painting a lot. You, you get used to, and you kind of start playing with, oh, well, what can I do? And um, it just adds a lot more. See, now even there, I was just apparently light enough. I almost got a stroke that looks like what I got when I was using that fine hairbrush, which I can't remember the name of. Do you, Carol, remember the name of those? No. All right. So, I wanted to tell you about this brush. This is... And I have a, a different sizes. As I said, these are very inexpensive. They, you'll see them for, uh, you'll lose hairs. Um, but whatever. They're a fun brush to use. They're used mainly uh, for like uh, Chinese calligraphy. And you will find though that they just have such a nice, where you can fill in an area, but then you get those little exciting areas of the brush stroke where it just adds so much to your painting. Um, even, for instance, on our, our little winter scene here, if I wanted to come in here and maybe add a little bit more depth to my snowbank, you know, I can come in here and... I'm not going to be too worried about it. I'm just going to kind of play with it. I want to try to create more of a shadow. I need to connect these pieces here. So as you see, you don't have to have your paper mounted. Um, I don't usually paint this way, but it, it, if it works, it works. Um, so. But see these brush strokes that you can get sometimes, and you get more of that sweep of a, a color. And if those harsh lines are something you want to avoid, just wet your paper. You can, you can drag that color all over the place. Um, so, the next recommendation was play with See what your brushes can do. You'll see some, um, this big mop thing. I mean, you could come down and, and just do crazy things with it. Or you could just come back in, what happened to our little it's like a mess sunset? Well, actually, I, I used to use this kind for putting blusher and bronzer on it. It worked very well. Because um, that's kind of what it reminded me of. But as you see, it, it's going to lay a lot of, of um, pigment. And you're, you're all going, that's not what I want to paint. I want to <laughs> paint something pretty. So... Kind of jumping all over. That'd be good for dry brush too if you just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and and dry brushes that here I'm giving you all these saturated um, versions, and you know, just put this wet guy back down here. Okay. So I was saying that when you're working with watercolor, you you build it up in layers, at least the way I paint, I'm building it up in a lot of layers. If I, this, you know, started with this kind of um, water scene and we've got the woods. As you see, this is all kind of laid in there very loosely. And now I can always come back in there and I'm going to come back to Regular brush. Let's see, now that I used all that red, I 
made my water really red. So if I wanted to come back in here and start indicating even more the the woods. In fact, let's come back to this guy. As you see how soft that is, it'll it'll just stay down sometimes, and that's that's just um, a characteristic of the type of hair that you are using. Um, but you can come in here, and in, instead of just filling in the area, you'll you'll have a little bit more of a natural kind of brush stroke coming in there. That's probably a little bit easier color for you to see there. So as you build up your areas and your woods start looking more like a woods and your waters come in, I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm starting to go, am I blocking the camera or what? I'm trying not to. You're, you're fine. All right. Sometimes you'll see, like if you are holding it down, you can play with um, sometimes the movement of it. That is, sometimes people will use a hair dryer to try to capture, you know, I don't want that to disperse any further. Um, so you can dry along. It will be just another, you know, your technique that you come up with. As you can see, I do get my rags pretty wet at some point. <laughs> and that's probably why some people use paper towels because they can just throw them out. All right, for another thing that you can use um, is natural sponge. So if I wanted to come in here and dulling down that green. That green is pretty bright and if you noticed I dipped into the red which is its complement and that is how you can tone down your uh, colors. You want to go down to the the complement. They're across from each other on the, uh, the wheel. I will still have a green but it won't be a screaming green as you see in that pan. So, and actually I added so much red, this is more of a brown. But we're just gonna smile, because you can't see me behind this mask anyway, and go, uh, that's exactly what I have in mind anyway. <laughs> now on this scene, we also have a little bit of reflection going on. Just drag those lines down into the the water all right so i was going to show you what you can do with your sponge so with when you do find natural sponges they're all different um and basically you just kind of look at it. This used to be a, a much larger sponge and I just break off pieces and this is the uh, one that I brought along with me. But they will have... Actually... This little brown area, that was created with using this sponge. So if I want to come back in here and maybe I want to come into some of these trees. As you can see in that pan, I have part of it as just the yellow and part of it as the orange. So now I've got a little bit of a variety on my brush, which is happens to be a sponge. So you can come in there 
and um, just to give you that little bit broken look of of the tree. Uh, add a little bit of guys up here, and you start to see a little bit more of the glow on the tree without breaking it up. If I were to come in here with just my regular brush, I'm going to see a little bit more of a stroke. It's going to be harder for me to uh, have that broken up area. So there again, just as you're painting every day and you're kind of messing around with it, you'll kind of figure out all the different approaches that you can use to this. Now also, as I, I was saying, with some of the colors, see now, now this, when it's wet, it has a lot more vibrancy to it. And then as it will dry down, you, you'll see it dull a little bit more. And, um, but I, I think watercolor is, is such a versatile medium. Uh, there are so many things that you can do with it. And I was going to show you now, this is something that I saw another artist demonstrate. And I, I just, it reminded me that I had this, I bought this years ago. Um, Magic Clean, or Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. Uh, we had a, a demo one time, and this woman was like, Hey, if you want to get rid of the color on your um, painting, just use this. And I do see in some of the online um, art supply stores, they are selling probably this, just repackaged differently without Mr. Clean's name on it. It is, when I saw it, and I don't really use it, I, I just, like I said, I was kind of showing you certain things you can do. Um, I had this, and I don't use it because I'm afraid, I don't know what's in it. It doesn't say on the box what this magic chemical is that's in here. So long term, I don't know if it's going to affect something on my painting, but people do use it and you can use it too. So if you, I just wet it with the, the clear water and I will come over to the side here. If you come in here, you will see how you can wipe out areas. So if I wanted to save something or I just needed more um, white. Sometimes you can get back down to it, uh, the paper. And it also depends on your paint. Your certain paints are um, more staining than others. But this is one way where if I had something that I just wanted to soften that area or maybe just bring it up a little bit more and, and not have it as dark as I had it. That's something that you could do. Um, in a lot of these brush strokes in here, they kind of scream at you because they're sharp. And with the snow, you don't necessarily want that. So this might be a way to soften some of those areas. Uh, the more you listen to artists talk, you'll, you'll hear them talking about uh, varying your edges. You want soft, you want hard, you want, and so sometimes you'll look at things and you'll go, oh, it's just, something's wrong. And, and maybe it's your edges. Maybe you need to come back in there and soften something up or make it harder, sharpen it. Um, Another thing is, is squinting at your painting to see, you know, how many um, values do I have? If you can't figure out what's wrong with your painting, you think, and if you squint at it, and it all kind of looks like it's all the same tone, that's more so the issue than, than anything else, is that you have, your values are all the same. That's for you. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I just wanted to show you Mr. Magic Eraser 
so you know that that is something. Now, I tend to, um, when I want to soften something, and this is where I was saying that um, I have ruined a few brushes, but now I have the brush that has all the polka dots on it. I know it's a good brush, but I also use it as a scrubber. If you find that you have something that you're not that crazy about it or it's just, just too hard, it's, what I tend to do is I will re-wet it and just kind of let that soften it for a second. You can always pick up any drips with your brush. Then I just kind of, I, I call it back scrubbing. I'm, this is a, uh, a sable, it is a soft brush, but um, it's already, I've lost the point on that one. This is its sister brush, and this is the one you will not see me back scrub on, but it, it still has its point. And this one you can see it's rounded off, and that's caused by pushing back on it. They do have brushes that um, are made specifically for scrubbing. I also tend to, I'm not a brush snob. I have found a lot of inexpensive brushes that become my favorites. These little besties are, they come in a pack and they're probably under $10. All different kinds and a lot of times I will find that I like to use these if I'm trying to soften an edge or and I will come back in there to uh, dig something out. So, all of this is kind of just play and if you don't treat everything as so precious, you know you have another piece of paper. You know you can probably come back and do this again and now they become um, inspiration for the next painting. So same thing up here. Some of these areas, they, they just look so hard to me and I might not want that in my painting. I might want to soften it. So if I don't necessarily want to add another color, um, I might want to soften it just by coming back in there with my water and I'm coming back or if I'm trying to recapture something that was a little bit lighter I will do that there again as you can see um, because this paper, it, it is substantial enough that it, it can just kind of um, hang on here without me having to have it on a support, I, ideally. I mean, I, <laughs> if I were sitting here home painting, I, I wouldn't be approaching it from the side or anything like this. But see now, this area, it doesn't scream out at me like, what the heck? And I don't see just that, that fan brush. Um, it softens that area. And same thing over here. Really got a glow to it now. Yeah, you, you can kind of come back down to what was under there or, or whatever. So sometimes I find that if I'm working on something and I'm just like, Oh, what is it? And I, I just put it away for a couple days, come back to it, and you'll just go, oh, well, look at that, you know, I've got that. Or you stare at it and you think, oh, what's that big blob right there? <laughs> you might be able to come back in there and just soften it up a little bit. Now, speaking of wet and blob and different techniques, another thing all right, I guess I was bouncing this. All right. That's probably showing you what that sponge can do a little bit better. Um, adds a lot of texture. You could use that um, when you were doing some rocks for a foreground. Um, you come back in there with your little 
the fan brushes will work for like your grasses and stuff too. So if you were making that little country scene and you've got your grass and you've got your foreground and a little guy here. With these little lashes. Yeah, they might even call it a lash brush. I'm not quite sure. Don't quote me on that one. So, another technique that watercolors will use sometimes, and it, it works for um, backgrounds really nicely. And since some of this takes a long time to dry, I, I did um, some of this earlier. You see this, I've got this piece of saran wrap on here. Now this has been sitting on here. And I put the saran wrap on this when it was wet. And then you just have to leave it and let it sit. Um, and then it'll create these interesting patterns. And you can do that multiple times. You can come back with another color. Put your... Um, saran wrap back on that again and it will keep creating these these shapes that um, you have no control over they just kind of appear and you kind of go with the flow so another thing we can do is when everything is wet just like this wet guy here who's really gotten some nice cool spidering going on right now that's kind of fun. So, and even this guy. You can take salt. You can use kosher. That is a, got a bigger grain. Uh, it's going to give you a little bit different. Um, the salt, if you shake it. Now, when you are doing this, you're going to have to let everything dry before you come back to this painting at this point. Because the salt will react with the water and... It'll make little starburst patterns and things. So sometimes if you're working on something with a, you know, maybe you're doing a portrait and you want just kind of a vague background, something like that will work well. Um, I actually started to do a little bit of it on this one, and it's created uh, some of those little darker spots you see that came from there. So this i just saturated this background and i do have the salt on there usually i just take it and with my hand once it's dry i can rub it down that way um i don't want to get salt all over carol's basement here so i also have it's gonna hurt <laughs> <laughs> i have this is it's um a rubber just a hard piece of rubber it's kind of like this shoe rubber and you, you'll find something around the house, but this also kind of works. An eraser will take it off. Um, and then you just need to basically scrub all that salt back off. So sometimes when I do do this, I think, well, I guess it, it didn't bother me that I had salt all over my paper. <laughs> um, so I don't know why I'd be bothered by Mr. Clean, but I have never done any experiments to see if Mr. Clean does anything. So, now you can see like how much texture just adding that salt to a very wet space it created just kind of these surprises. Um, and then if you use the saran wrap you can create more just unique shapes and you'll have people going, hmm, how did you get to that? Because if you tried to paint that, it, you, it wouldn't look like that. So these are just little things that uh, if you think that just doing watercolor is taking that brush, dipping it in your pan and, and going on, there's so many things that you can do um, to create different textures and uh, make things a, a little bit more exciting. And I also wanted to show you once again, 
as I showed you how the paper mounts on the, the home soap, it also comes up very easily. When you're ready to take your work of art and, and turn it into a uh, frame it or whatever. Um, with the staples usually I just come under, a lot of times I come under the paper and I'm just lifting slightly and grabbing my staple and I'll get it started and sometimes as long as your paper, if you're using this on a, a 90, you'll see sometimes a 90 paper in a pad and that one is a little bit lighter. I, you might want to pull all your staples with that one. This one, um, it's pretty safe to go ahead and just pull all of those when you're done. And don't cut yourself. I had a magnet here. There we go. But you can just remove this and then your board is ready for your next painting. And this guy is ready to go to his frame. Now, we can get into, let's see, oh, another thing before I actually start painting, painting. Um, if you have a lot of you know, if you have just your one set, even this, you don't know what colors are actually in those tubes. Um, what I recommend, and I, I've done that actually with all of these, is um, all my paints at home. And this is another thing that I, I love about the fact that I had to stay home, is it gave me time to do all these projects that I wanted to get to and just haven't had a chance to get to. So for the watercolors, I took watercolor paper and I, I just marked it off and I made myself color charts. So that way, because as I said, I will play around with different manufacturers too. And so if I'm looking at this, I'm like, ah, oh, look at the vibrancy of this ultramarine blue. And that, well, that's my whole bind. And I, I made it so I could see what the color looked like and when it's full blast, you know, full concentration. And then I, I kind of uh, let it bleed out so I could see, you know, what does it look like when it's really, really reduced with a lot of water. It kind of can tell, you can also see who's going to stain more, too by doing this. And so to me this is invaluable reference because I can see, oh well, you know, this is this color actually full strength and even watered out. There's not that much difference in the value. But something like this, you can go from you know, completely strong to uh, just hardly anything. The other thing that you'll see is if you have paints from different manufacturers. It might all say the same thing, the ultramarine uh, blue. This is also an ultramarine blue right above it. And you'll see that there's this one is an ultramarine blue green shade. And you can see there's a big difference between this color and that color. So now when I am starting with my palette, and if I have a painting in mind, um, I have a lot of these these trays and sometimes I am putting out paint specifically to a painting and I'll use it just for that tray. Um, and so if you swatch all your, your pigments it, it makes it so much easier because otherwise you open your drawer and all you see is a tube. You don't know what's in there until you swatch it out. I've done this with all my acrylics and all my oils and um, the same thing. It just, it's so, to me, it's so very helpful. Plus, I just have fun making them because I enjoy looking at all the colors. <laughs> so, 
This is easily amused. Here we go. But that's, I guess, as artists, we tend to be color junkies. So I wanted you to know or to look at that. And I think that is. Oh, another little handy thing to have is a tiny spritzer bottle because I can come into I can re-wet areas but I can also come into my painting and make things happen if I want to do something like that too so it's a lot of things and this is more of a pour paint technique if you start doing that um, I think that was all I wanted to show you on the variants of some of the things that you probably already have around your house. And another thing when I was uh, showing you the lines. Another brush that we have. These are called riggers. And um, as you can see, they're very long. And they all create, and that's why they're called riggers, uh, when you saw those little pictures of the boats and they're drawing all the little lines for the sails and things. They're probably using more of a, a rigger brush because it allows you to have a very long, fine line. And you down there. So if you're working on your painting and let's say you want to throw some more tree branches in, if you use these, you'll get those little long um, and when you are doing little branches and things like this, you, you don't really want to come up and go, okay, and then it went like this. Nobody's going to say, you know, that's not what that branch looked like. <laughs> um, and the, you kind of want to have it broken up anyway because, you know, you, you want to have that essence of that. You know, they, they can see their trees, they have branches. They're, they're not, um, you don't have to follow that line. Unless that's your style. Actually, you probably do see some people where it looks great. Um, but if you're just doing something like this, there again, play with it. And if it works for you, great. Um, so this way we kind of just get that idea of a tree stand back there. But we're not going too crazy. Yeah. Let me see. When I'm working on more of a building like this, another thing I, I might do is on um, a lot of my rulers, I've glued pieces of foam core. So I've given it a lift. Because if I were to try to draw a line with a ruler just straight like down. When I go to make that line, I have the chance of the paint leaking under. And, oh, sorry. I didn't leak. Sorry. <laughs> Let's make it leak. Um, well, that didn't do too bad either. But it will carry underneath there. Um, and so you don't, if you want to avoid that, and you do have something that you want to make a lot of uh, fine lines. Let's, let's say you're, you're doing something like your old clapboard barn. And you don't have to paint every line. Um, if you go ahead and you give your line and it's breaking up, go with it. it it's not, that's part of the difference between uh, that barn board uh, painted by Andrew Wyeth and, and uh, the one where 
somebody more just came in there and decided they needed the full line the whole way. Um, it, there's uh, a little bit more excitement if that line is broken up, if that line is varied in the tones. And this is not working that well for that. I'm going to come back to one of my flats. Now, there again, the flat... This one is bigger and wider, so if you're doing it this way, you might want to check to see how thick of a line you're going to get when you do paint with that. But if you are trying to make some lines, here, let's see if I can get this guy to feed under there better. And you're trying to follow it with your ruler. Uh, I guess I've, I've done it both ways, and I'm not really showing you how it feeds under. Oh, that one's better. But anyway, <laughs> if you find that when you're painting and you're trying to do a straight line, then you're using your ruler and you're running into bleeds, then give yourself a little lift and you should be able to take care of that. So, now I think I can, I'm going to change my water so we can make a stop and then I'll sit and work on one of the actual paintings and things.